Disney's Art of Animation is a vibrant and whimsically themed resort, conveniently connected to Epcot and Hollywood Studios, offering a unique opportunity for guests to immerse themselves in the worlds of some of Disney's most cherished movies. But with a price tag nearly double that of other value resorts, is this popular family resort worth it for your next trip to Walt Disney World? Hi, I'm the Frugal Brit and for this video I'll be providing a guide and review of almost everything the light touches at Disney's Art of Animation Resort. Before we get into it, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on future Disney World and Orlando vacation content. Disney's Art of Animation opened back in 2012 within the wider Epcot Resort area and adjacent to Disney's Pop Century, nestled around the Hourglass Lake, which we'll be swooping over later in the video. The resort's theme revolves around celebrating Disney's rich legacy of animation, in particular these four classics displayed on the resort's facade next to the entrance. These movies are the inspiration for the resort's four distinct sections which surround the animation hall lobby building to the west, which is where we'll begin our tour of the resort. Upon entering Animation Hall, attention will be quickly drawn to the lobby's walls adorned with a mesmerising collection of sketches, concept art and storyboards tracing the journey of character creation from pencil sketches to finished colourful creations. A major focal point of Animation Hall is the stunning chandelier inspired by storyboards made of hundreds of hand-drawn animation sketches. Under the chandelier is the entrance to the ink and paint store, themed to look like an animator's workspace, and carries a wide range of merchandise, including Disney-themed clothing, accessories, toys and collectibles, as well as snacks, toiletries and medication. Opposite ink and paint is the Pixel Play Arcade, one of Disney World's largest arcades, which offers a wide variety of games for all ages, with some awarding points that can be redeemed for prizes. Next, we'll head for the Landscape of Flavours, the resort's food court and only substantial dining location at Art of Animation. Its seating areas are divided into the four different Disney movies, each with their themed landscape artwork and light fixtures. There's several different food stations. Over on the far left side is the grab and go section, selling fresh fruit salads, pastries, snacks and beverages. Next to this is the cafe, serving a limited selection of hot and cold speciality coffees. To the right during breakfast is the grill station, serving egg, bacon, sausage, potato barrels and Mickey waffles. Further down is the omelette station, followed by the pancake bay. For lunch and dinner, there's an international cuisine bay, serving a rotating menu with the likes of tandoori chicken, chicken stir fry and seared salmon. On the far right is the burger bay, serving beef, pulled pork, chicken and vegan burgers. Then in the middle there's an Italian section that serves several pasta dishes and pizzas, including gluten-free pizzas if you ask the head chef. There's also a chili cheese all beef footlong hot dog. Last thing whilst we're in here, Disney does offer refillable mugs at this and most other Disney World Resort food courts, and I'll provide info on how this works in the video description. So that concludes our look around Animation Hall. Now we'll head outside to tour the different themed sections that house all the guest rooms, the most expensive of which are found in the nearby Finding Nemo section because of its short distance to the main lobby and the Skyliner. Inspired by the Grand Barrier Reef, with vibrant colours, immersive landscaping and larger-than-life character statues, including Crush and Mr. Ray, that provide some great photo opportunities. As with all sections except for the Little Mermaid area, the Finding Nemo buildings house exclusively family suites. I'll be showing you these towards the end of the video. In the middle of the courtyard is the Big Blue Pool, the largest at Walt Disney World with over 300,000 gallons of water, themed after the ocean where Nemo and his friends live. There's a zero entry section bordered by coral reefs and giant spraying jellyfish structures. Adjacent to the pool is the Schoolyard Sprayground Kids Splash Pad, which features water jets, sprinklers, and scented by Nemo and Marlin peeking out of the sea anemone. Facing towards Animation Hall is the drop-off pool bar, featuring a lengthy menu of snacks and beverages, including the Big Blue Ocean Speciality Cocktail. Behind the spray ground is Squirt's Righteous Reef, a Nemo-themed playground offering a safe space for kids to climb and play whilst surrounded by the movie's motifs. In the evening, you can watch some of your favourite Disney films at the Big Blue Pool in the fresh evening air at 8.30 nightly. I'll list the other recreational activities in the video description. If we head south of Finding Nemo, we'll come to the Cars section, which transports guests to the desert town of Radiator Springs, the fictional town from the Cars movies, reminiscent of Route 66, and featuring the likes of Lightning McQueen, Sally, Mater, Luigi and Guido. To enter the guest room buildings, which house exclusively family suites, you step into the different shops from Radiator Springs. In terms of theming outside of the guest rooms, I'd say this is the most impressive part of the resort. You'll also find the Cozy Cone Pool area here, themed after the Cozy Cone Motel, a quieter option compared to the Big Blue Pool, with cone cabanas offering shade and seating. 
Next, we'll head towards the top of the resort map for the Lion King section, which has more of a natural setting, names to evoke the vast savannas and landscapes of Africa featured in the movie. Rafiki greets guests when entering the Pride Lands from the lobby side, and behind him is Mufasa standing tall on Pride Rock guarding his kingdom of family suites, as well as the misbehaving Simba, Pumba and Timon hanging out on their log bridge. Greeting guests from the north entrance is the less imposing Zazu and a sneering scar, followed by the elephant graveyard playground, the homeland of the hyenas. There's no swimming pool courtyard between the buildings here, but there is a small campfire to roast marshmallows between 6.30 and 7.30. I do personally prefer the Lion King aesthetic to the other movies, however the characters and overall theming outside is definitely less impressive here. The last section to cover is the Little Mermaid area, adorned with playful theming from the Little Mermaid universe and filled with treasures that Ariel has rescued from the human world. Unlike all other sections, these buildings feature only standard rooms, which I'll cover later, and these are entered via colourfully decorated exterior walkways. Fans of the oversized characters won't be disappointed. This section has some of the best, including Ariel's gifted statue of Prince Eric demonstrating his fealty, Sebastian leading an orchestra from his oyster shell. At the entrance to the West Building stands a 35-foot model of a slightly creepy-looking King Triton, while on the opposite side, an equally impressive model of Ursula welcomes visitors to the East and building. Nestled in the centre of the courtyard is the Flippin' Fins pool surrounded by palm trees, the resort's other quiet pool. And facing this from the north building is Ariel's giant model, joined by Flounder and Friends, the main centrepiece of the Little Mermaid section. Next, I'll take you on a quick tour of the rooms. I'll start with an internally accessed Lion King family suite where I've recently stayed. These sleep up to six people with light green walls and a number of jungle-inspired theming elements. Gone are the old carpets. All suites now feature hard floors with a textured pebble pattern. On your right from the main door is a table with stackable chairs. This table combines as a pull-down Murphy bed and reveals a sleeping Simba on a hammock of vines. There's AC outlets and USB ports above both nightstands. Opposite the Murphy bed is the first of two bathrooms separated by a sliding door with a large single vanity area and themed mirror with vanity light. Past the toilet, the shower curtain reveals tiles that depict the circle of life sunrise, a bathtub, refillable soap, shampoo and conditioner, and a rainfall shower head. In the living room area, you have a darker green accent wall behind a kitchenette, the sofa bed and a pair of log-shaped coffee tables. In the kitchenette, you'll find a sizable mini fridge, Cuisinart coffee maker, and Twining's tea and Joffrey's coffee, which is restocked every other day. Above the sink is the microwave, where you'll also find paper plates and plastic utensils and a nice bucket. Next to the kitchenette is the red pull-out sofa bed behind some disapproving giraffes, which sleeps two guests, relatively easy to open and close, almost as easy as hitting that subscribe button for future Orlando guides and reviews. In the corner is the coffee table with integrated lights designed like drooping flowers. Opposite the sofa bed is the TV and large dresser with plenty of drawer space, four AC outlets and four USB ports, and a new Amazon Alexa enabled virtual assistant, which you can use to request extra towels, pillows or coffee, etc. Next to this is some closet space and hangers above a large drawer. Over to the main bedroom, you'll find Zazu standing over a raised queen-sized bed. On both sides of the bed are nightstands holding drooping flower lamps, which contain AC outlets and USB ports. On the other side is another TV with the same outlets and ports as the other dresser. Behind the door is a luggage rack, iron, ironing board, safe and more closet space. One of the best things about the Art of Animation family suite is that you get an ensuite bathroom for the main bedroom, separated by a hinged door, which reveals another large single vanity with the same features and theming. But there's no bathtub in this one, instead you get a walk-in shower. Over in the Finding Nemo suite, you can expect all the same features, but with different theming of course. Inside the bathrooms, there's submarine theming. I do personally slightly prefer the Lion King, as the Finding Nemo suites offer a little bit too much colour for my liking. If you prefer a slightly less gaudy style compared to the Finding Nemo and Lion King suites, I'd have to recommend the car suites. As mentioned a couple times earlier in the video, the Little Mermaid section is where you'll find the two queen bed standard rooms, similar to what you'd find at all other Disney World Valley resorts. No family suites over here. Inside these rooms are ocean blue walls and floors, themed table and chairs, a large TV and dresser with the same outlets as the family suites, but half of the storage is taken up by the mini fridge. On top there's a coffee maker. On the bedside, Flounder and Sebastian are in between two queen beds with giant seashell headboards and light up pearls. A curtain separates the bathroom area with single vanity and next to this is the closet space and the iron and ironing board, safe and luggage rack combo. Opposite in the toilet room is a bathtub and Ariel's grotto themed tiles. 
Next, we'll head back outside to cover what is clearly the best selling point for staying at both Art of Animation and Pop Century, which is the Skyliner Transportation, which takes guests over to both Epcot and Disney's Hollywood Studios. To use this, you take a short walk over the bridge to the east of the resort for the Skyliner Station, located over Hourglass Lake, located in between Art of Animation and Pop Century. The queue may be longish at times, but always moves super quick. This operates an hour before early theme park entry begins at Epcot or Hollywood Studios and closes 90 minutes after the parks close. Whether you're headed for Epcot or Hollywood Studios, you'll jump on the same gondola which glides over the lake, arriving at Disney's Caribbean Beach Resort in a few minutes. Once you've arrived, you'll follow the signs for which park you need to travel to. For those headed for Hollywood Studios, you only have to change once at Caribbean Beach, then you head west before being dropped off at the gate. For Epcot, you have a longer and less direct route. Whilst you only have to change at Caribbean Beach, there is a minor transfer point when you get to the Riviera Resort, but you just stay on board as you cruise through the station. The process on the way back is basically the same, the most convenient transportation in Disney World, and the main reason I booked for my last trip. What is not quite as convenient is the bus transportation, the station which is located to the west of the resort, which you access from an entrance near the Ink and Paint Store in Animation Hall, where buses depart roughly every 20 minutes. I'll provide a link in the description which explains the Disney World bus transportation system in more detail. I've never been a big fan of these buses, but Art of Animation doesn't share buses with any other Disney World hotels, so strangely has the best bus service along with Pop Century compared to all other moderate, deluxe and valley resorts. Whichever way you travel to the parks, guests of Art of Animation get to enjoy early theme park entry and other on-site benefits that I've covered in previous videos. For any newbies, I'll leave some stuff in the video description explaining this in more detail. So should you book Art of Animation? I'd say it succeeds in immersing guests in some of Disney's most cherished films with the best kid-friendly theming you'll find. Well, there are some key things to consider before deciding whether to book, a question that needs to be separated between the family suites and the Little Mermaid standard rooms. We'll start with the Little Mermaid rooms. Unless you're massively keen on this specific theming, it is hard to justify these rooms, to be honest, when the standard rooms at the All Star Resort and Pop Century are so much cheaper. The Little Mermaid rooms are also located quite far away from the lobby amenities. Not so bad when travelling from the Skyliner, but when headed back from the buses, it is a bit of a pain. So overall, the people I'd recommend these rooms to is quite specific, I'm sorry to say. Moving on to the family suite, for a resort which describes itself as being value, the prices are pretty shocking. For a Friday in March without discounts, it costs $645 pre-tax, that's almost triple the price of a standard room at one of the all-star resorts, and double the cost of a standard room at Pop Century, which also has access to the Skyliner. Because of this, many groups may want to book an off-site villa or suite for half the price, and some groups of four and under without kids may prefer two connecting standard rooms at Pop Century, and unless there's a need for the kitchenette and microwave, etc. But for groups of five and six, the separation of the beds might be preferable in the suites. Technically speaking, the suites are bigger than two standard rooms combined. If I was to attempt to justify the price, I'd point to the fun theming and excellent room quality when compared to the all-star resorts and pop century. These do feel like moderate tier rooms inside a value resort. I'd also point to the Skyliner access. This was the main reason why I and maybe the majority of people decided to book this resort. This is such a nice way to get back to the hotel after a long day looping around World Showcase. This transportation, along with early park admission, is a killer combo which maybe justifies the premium rates. One comparison that isn't sufficiently favourable in my opinion is with the much cheaper Cabana Bay Beach Resort, Universal's equivalent hotel which offers similar but slightly inferior family suites. For example, there's only one toilet and most of them are externally accessed. I stayed at both earlier this year within a week of each other. I have to say, I do think you get a lot more for your money in terms of the amenities, the pools, slide, lazy river, walking distance to the parks, etc. Everyone in my family agreed except for my five-year-old who loved the characters. It's easy to underestimate the impact of the theming for this age group. Based on my recent visits, I did prefer Bayliner Diner to Landscape of Flavours, slightly tainted by my disappointment with the coffee. Should be said though that Landscape of Flavours is the best Disney World Resort food court. In conclusion, the price point will be a deterrent for many travellers, justifiably so, but its unique theming paired with the convenience of the Skyliner transportation can make it an attractive option for families seeking that authentic Walt Disney World on-site experience. Well that's it for this video, thanks for watching, do check out my other hotel reviews if you're planning your next trip to Orlando, and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on future Orlando vacation content.